Well, good evening, everybody. How's everybody? Good. My name's John Tillman. I'm the CEO of the Illinois Policy Institute. That means I work for Christina Rasmussen, our executive vice president, on a daily basis. Uh, Christina is one of the, I call, we call it managing up. She's one of the best managing up people I've ever worked with. It's really quite impressive. She's making me read homework right now for something I'm doing tomorrow. I'll have to stay up all night doing that. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, anyway, we're glad you're here. And uh, I just want to touch base with you and ask you this question. How many of you are feeling somewhat optimistic, cautiously so, because this is Illinois, optimistic about the trend lines in Illinois? Five years ago when I would have asked that question, not a single hand would have gone up. Things are changing in Illinois. Ideas that we've been advocating for seven years have now been getting traction for some length of time. Uh, the analogy I like to use that some of you have heard before is that in 1988, September, I went over to uh, uh, Europe and spent a day in East Berlin. And if you, when I came out of there, it was one of the most amazing experiences uh, I've ever had in my life. Uh, the horror of tyranny uh, and, uh, frankly, the horror of not having a free market where people are free to unleash their human potential uh, is, is really disturbing to see. It was like walking into a black and white movie. Someone asked me later on, what was the difference between West Berlin and East Berlin and the East and the West? And I said, well, it's neon. It's all about neon. Because neon is what capitalism is all about. I've got something I think is really cool, and I want to do a deal with you. And you've got something really cool, and you want to do a deal with me. That's the essence of capitalism. The essence of capitalism is an entrepreneur, maybe an investor, uh, get together, they hire some workers, and then they do something really, really well. They serve other people. And when you were in East Berlin, people were not being served. They were living in tyranny and, and frankly, uh, uh, desperation in many ways. When I came back out and everybody uh, asked me about it, not a person would have said that the Berlin Wall would come down 14 months later, just 14 months later. Everybody thought it was this miracle that happened over 14 months. But the truth is that all the predicates that needed to be in place for major change like that were already happening inside East Berlin and inside uh, the, the Soviet bloc. All the predicates were already running. And so my point about Illinois is that for a long time, we at the Illinois Policy Institute and many other good organizations have been fighting to create those predicates here in Illinois for change. Uh, the Liberty Speaker Series, this event we do here, is one such predicate we've been doing for many years. We do many other things uh, beyond that. I'll give you one example. Uh, how many of you are aware that there was an attempt to put a progressive tax into law here in Illinois? That is excellent. How many of you are aware that after that was defeated, there was an attempt to make the 2011 tax hike permanent rather than have it sunset? Very good. We spend over $1 million in paid advertising to defeat those bills. $1 million. That's not for labor. That's not for our policy team or our, our team down in Springfield uh, that advocates on behalf of policies. Uh, this was paid media. Uh, that complementing the other media we do internally that we control internally, uh, gave us market share to compete with all the advocates for that progressive tax. And we ended up winning all three of the tax like fights this spring. One million dollars, well spent, and getting a $30 billion return, which is the savings that the people of Illinois will now realize by keeping that uh, progressive tax off the table and keeping the sunset on as scheduled. So that becomes possible because of all of you, and I just want to share that with you, and thank you for that. Now, <clears throat> having said that, I'm going to slide into one of the most fun bios I have ever read. First of all, there was a word here that I had to ask Christina how to pronounce, and you'll hear that in a moment. But I have to say, I have introduced many people, Deirdre, and I have read many bios. There are few that are as entertaining as this one. Thus, I am going to read it word for word so that you too can have the joy I have had today. Deirdre McClowski teaches economics, history, English, and communication at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Okay, I gotta pause. Think about that for a minute. Economics, history, English, and communication. Most of us can't figure out one choice in life. You know, marketing, uh, accounting, finance. Wow. Okay, you're gonna have to expand on that and explain that, Deirdre, a little bit more in a minute. So, I mean, I just, wow, you know, I thought the Dos Equis guy was the most interesting person on earth, but I gotta tell you, that's pretty impressive. A well-known economist and historian and rhetorician, rhetorician, 
How do you say that word, Deirdre? The rhetorician. Rhetorician. That is not a word you encounter in everyday uh, conversation. Rhetorician. I just want to prove that I'm coachable and can be trained. Uh, she has written 16 books. Uh, she actually wrote them. So I've written several books, but all in my head, not actually typed out. She actually types them out and gets them published, which I think is very impressive. Uh, 16 books and around 400 scholarly pieces on topics ranging from technical economics and statistics to transgender advocacy and the ethics of the bourgeois virtues. If you speak to some people, there is no virtue in bourgeois living, so I think this will be fun too. She is known as a quote-unquote cons uh, conservative economist, University of Chicago style, where she taught for 12 years. But she protests that I'm, quote, I'm a literary, quantitative, postmodern, free market, progressive Episcopalian, Midwestern woman from Boston who once was a man, not conservative. I'm a Christian libertarian. That deserves a round of applause. I want you to know I read that six times and I still don't know what the hell it meant, but I enjoyed every minute of it. Her latest book, Bourgeois Dignity, Why Economics Can't Explain the Modern World, which argues that an ideological change rather than saving our exploitation is what made us rich, which actually there's a lot of substance in that sentence and is, is quite uh, profound. Uh, it's the second in a series of four on the bourgeois era. Uh, the first was the bourgeois virtues, ethics for an age of commerce. I'm gonna skip ahead here a little bit. Uh, that one uh, asks uh, if a participant in a capitalist economy can have an ethical life. Deidre says briefly, yes. Quote, we fans of innovation and markets have done enough preaching to the choir, she says. Now you're into my wheelhouse. I like to play Red Rover, not preach to the choir. And that is what you are doing. We need to speak to our beloved critics on the left and right who do not think that the age of innovation was the best thing to happen since the invention of language. I could not agree more. And seriously, one of the great challenges of our movement is playing Red Rover. Red Rover, Red Rover, let the soft progressive or leftist come over and embrace free enterprise as the greatest force for good ever created in the human sphere. And that is what we are about here. Yes, let us applaud that. Long known in economics as a critic of its least sensible techniques. Anybody that is a critic of least sensible techniques, I'm immediately a fan of. She wrote in 2008 with St Stephen Ziliak, The Cult of Statistical Significance. Now that is a title that is not marketing centric, I just want to add. But it does, the book did demolish test of quote unquote significance and it was in 2011 the basis of a Supreme Court decision. So even though the title is not marketing centric, it was impactful in terms of public policy. Deidre lives in downtown Chicago. I'm getting to the really good stuff now. Deidre lives in downtown Chicago in a big loft apartment converted from a factory with her Norwich Terrier, Will Shakespeare. And as she says about Will Shakespeare, her dog, quote, as soon as he really knows English, maybe we can get some more plays from the canine point of view. I give you Deidre McClowski. speech defect so you can either adjust to it or run screaming from the room. I, I'm hardened, I've always had it, so uh, it, it won't be, it won't crush me if you can't handle it. The, the argument of these three volumes, I was going to do four, at one point I was going to do six volumes and call it a sexology and sell a lot of books, but that didn't meet the test of bourgeois virtue. So now it's three volumes, a trilogy. This week I'm going to finish volume three. I'm going to send volume three to the University of Chicago Press, and then with the other two, which you can buy back there, I'll be glad to sign them to spoil their second-hand value. Uh, with those three, I'll have enough, since they're big, thick books, to have, now how cool is this, a boxed set. <laughs> like Harry Potter. <laughs> if, I, if I earn one hundredth of her royalties, I'll not only die happy, but rich. <laughs> so here's the point of the three. They're a full-scale defense of what we usually call capitalism. I don't much like the word, I think it's a misleading word, but we're more or less, um, uh, uh, I'm 
stuck with it. And the, the, the offense is not just that capitalism has made us rich, as it has, but that it's also made us good. That it's not the case that participation in a market economy is corrupting. That, that's the theme in particular of the first volume called The Bourgeois Virtues. And the theme of the second volume is to look into the alleged causes of the enriching effect of markets and free innovation and free and open societies, such as on the whole we have in the high-income countries. Now, the, the explicandum, as we say in Latin, the thing to be explained is how we got from an average in 1800 of about $3 a day of income, of consumption, of production, since they all have to be the same in aggregate, how we got from $3 a day, a level which some countries still have, Bangladesh uh, is an example, how we got from $3 a day to what now in the United States is about $130 a day for every man, woman, and, and child in the, in the country. Now, of course, that's an average, so there's inequality. The left has, um, has discovered in the last few years that some people have higher incomes than others. I'm shocked. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but, but the average is terribly important because it means that your ancestors, unspeakably poor, as the ancestors of everyone in this room were, were down at, at the level of Bangladesh or um, Britain in 1800 at $6 a day. As my mom is 92 says, Six dollars a day is no bag of bluebirds either. <laughs> I've never understood why bags of bluebirds are desirable, but that's what she says. Six dollars a day is horrible. Three dollars a day is worse. The ancestors of all of us were very poor, and here we are discussing the past, present, and future of, of um, capitalism on a Wednesday evening with the with a glass of wine. Now, the usual explanations are two. On the left, the essential explanation is that we got rich by exploitation. That we got rich, for example, by exploiting the working class and the Industrial Revolution. And people always mention Charles Dickens in this connection. I yield to no one in my admiration of the art of Charles Dickens, but I don't think much of his economics. And so somehow mysteriously extracting surplus value from the workers then made us all rich, including the workers. It's a very strange argument. And it depends, as the argument from the right does, on a belief that it's investment that made us rich, that it's capital accumulation, that it's piling brick upon brick, BA upon BA. So the, so, so the Marxist argument is you take the surplus value, it's reinvested, and then endlessly capitalism gets richer. Now the trouble with this is that we've always had exploitation, at least by the Marxist definition, yet we've not always been rich. From the time of the invention, the, the perfection of language, 
about 100,000 years ago in Africa. By the way, everyone in this room is an African. Um, since then, we went along at $3 a day. I, I always draw a diagram. This is, my finger has an amazing quality that I can draw with its scientific diagrams. They're very accurate. It's in the finger. It's like a pianist, a great pianist. It's in the finger muscle. M not muscle memory, but m muscle intelligence. And here we are going along at $3 a day from the caves. And we go $3 a day. This is 100,000 years ago. $3 a day, $3 a day. See, look, it goes up and down occasionally, but not very much. And then about here, we have the invention of agriculture. Very nice. And the people get better, and then they get worse <laughs> because of Malthusian mechanisms. And then agriculture, that just makes the landlords, the specialists in violence, the, um, the uh, um, stationary bandits better off. The average of our ancestors, not any better off at all. $3 a day, $3 a day. Now we're at 1,800. Now you have to watch this very closely. This is a scientific diagram. It goes whoosh. The whoosh is very important. because $3 a day to $130 a day. And indeed, in the world as a whole, including in Bangladesh and Zimbabwe and other sad cases, even if you, if you talk about the whole world, it's gone from $3 a day in 1800 to now about $33 a day, a factor of 10. $33 a day is about the income per head of Brazil. They go, oh, Brazil's very poor. No, Brazil now has an income about what the United States had in 1941. It's about the same. Um, and that's a tremendous improvement over $3 or $6. So it's, it's not exploitation. Exploitation doesn't work. The sort of modern version of this that, you, that I hear from my friends in the English department and I'm, I'm in the English department. These are my friends. I'm not just being sarcastic here. They say, oh, no, okay, I understand. It's not the exploitation of the working class back in England in 1800 or 1820 or 1840. It's the exploitation right now of the third world. It's ripping off the poor in the rest of the world that makes us rich that we in the first world are rich only because we've stolen, enslaved, all those, all those other folks. Now the trouble, there are many troubles with that, one of them which is those, those exploited people in the third world in China and India are growing like mad. India and China, this is the most important event of our lifetime. India and China are growing at from 7 to 12 percent per capita per year. 7 to 12 percent in per capita terms. This is the big story. Not the great, race, not the great recession or inequality or any of that nonsense. By the way, world inequality has fallen like a stone in the last 30 or 40 years. We have a much more equal division of this $33 a day than we had back when it was $3 a day. So it, that doesn't work. And in fact, does it strike you as a good, good business plan to depend for your own income on robbing the homeless in the neighborhood? <laughs> if you were going to rob people, if you're, say, Britain, and you're going to rob someone, why not the Germans? <laughs> or the Americans? Or the French? They've, they've, they've tried all three of those. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, stealing from poor people is not enriching, if all it is is stealing. If it's mutually advantageous exchange, then both are made better off. If, more to the point, it's the invention innovation that has happened in the last two centuries 
then really all boats rise. And that's indeed what, on the whole, has happened since 1800. So, so the exploitation argument doesn't work. But neither does the argument that will be much more popular in this room, which is that it's investment. It's accumulation. And notice that the exploitation argument uses the investment argument. Marx was a classical economist. And Marx and his friends um, thought of investment as the key to enrichment. But think about it. Without innovation, without betterment, without creativity, novelties, new ideas, piling brick on brick runs into sharply diminishing returns. Look around you. So, so someone was pointing this out to me earlier. Look at all these little law books. Aren't they wonderful? My father was a constitutional historian, and he had a big run of the Supreme Court uh, reporter. The, the lawyers here know that this is just wallpaper. <laughs> it's been innovated out of existence. Creative destruction has made these books wholly obsolete. Now, it's nice wallpaper. I like it. Nice little, nice color, I guess. But um, it's, it's of no use to any lawyer in this room. Because if you need to know what the relevant cases are, you go to your computer, not to a law to a law book, unless you're old like me. So adding, piling up books reaches a point where its marginal product, as we say in economics, its extra value is below zero. If you don't have innovation. If you have innovation, then you're able to invest in uh, computers and, and va various ways of accessing cases and have keywords and everything, and except they have keywords in these, but they, they, now they have them electronically. And, and if you think through the tools of our lives, our cell phones, for example. You know, the older people here remember when you had to have quarters or dimes to make a call. Well, you know, in some parts of the world you do, but mostly you don't. And indeed, in the third world, this third world that's supposed to be exploited and terribly damaged by our activity, they've been able to leap over the laying of copper wires all over the place because of the uh, um, um, cell phone. So what's the driver? What made us move from $3 to $130 a day? Was it trade unions? Was it regulations? Was it government taxation and policy? No. It was new ideas, innovation. Let's see we can do a cell phone here. <laughs> I agree. I agree. So what we need to know is why it happened this one time in Northwestern Europe and now is spreading to the world. It didn't happen for the material reasons that I've been complaining about for the last few minutes. It didn't happen because of exploitation. It didn't happen because of investment. It wasn't routine investment in human capital, as some of my ec e economist colleagues will argue. It was not uh, because of uh, of um, foreign trade, it wasn't because of that. It, now here's one that'll, that'll, that'll irritate you, I think. It's not because of coal. People love to think of coal as the cause of the modern world. Now the trouble with coal as the cause of the modern world is the coal was there before. 
hmm, a little odd. And in places like China, they were massively exploiting coal a thousand years before the Europeans were. They were making glass with coal. They were making, above all, what we call, surprisingly, China with coal because it was a higher t t temperature even than charcoal. So it, what is it that made for this astonishing leap forward? Because as I said, it goes along for $3 a day. And then we overcome it. We overcome Malthus. Our, our friends, if you have any, who are uh, p p population control mavens, I don't like them very much. <laughs> they're, they're, I haven't got too many friends who are population control mavens. But they say, more people are bad for us on Malthusian grounds. Diminishing returns to land. We're going to run out of rare earths. Well, you know, the rare earths weren't rare until they discovered that they could be used for, 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 for batteries and computers. Um, once we heated our, we, 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 we lit our houses with whale oil. That would, if we still had the same technology, those would be whale oil lamps up there. And then we discovered kerosene, uh, coal oil, they call it. So what, what, there's the puzzle. There's the historical puzzle. Why did innovation suddenly take off around 1800? And my answer is simple and I think persuasive. It's that before 1800 in most countries and indeed in now still in many countries, the bourgeoisie, the middle class, were held in contempt. People were suspicious of them, they still are. They're, people are still suspicious of, of the middleman of the, of the realtor, for example. Um, they're st they still think, oh, she could have given me a better deal. And that's true, she could have given you a better deal if she was in the business for charitable purposes. <laughs> um, but, so, so it's, it's, it's this ancient hostility to the trader, the merchant, the person who buys low and sells high, buys ideas low and sells them high, Bio, buys innovative ideas about steam engines and electric m motors and, and the modern research university and all these things and sells them high. That changed. How did it change? It changed. I say in my third volume, which you should put your orders in early at the University of <laughs> Chicago Press because it's going to sell out just in a week. Once it, in about a year, it'll be published and you, you're, it'll be Harry Potter. Oh, okay. um, it, 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 what happened was, uh, the, the third volume is called Bourgeois Equality. Bourgeois Equality. And I'm really kind of elbowing the, the left here a bit by pointing out that the fundamental kind of equality that we want is equality of before the law and equality of respect. That's what we want in our societies. Equality of outcome is nice, and I would argue that in terms of real comfort has been pretty much achieved in high-income countries. Even poor people in high-income companies, as you, you were saying, have, have cell phones and color TVs often, often have air conditioning. I'm not saying I would uh, eagerly change places <laughs> with, with <laughs> someone with a much lower income than mine. But I am saying that it doesn't matter much that someone has a 100-foot yacht and I don't. I actually find it quite annoying that I don't <laughs> have a 100-foot yacht, but, but I'm not willing to use the power of the state to re 
it can cover from that insult. <laughs> I, I, so, I, bourgeois equality is a matter of human equality, of deep equality. I call it Scottish. The Scottish Enlightenment is the source rather than the French Enlightenment. In the Scottish Enlightenment of uh, Adam Smith, um, <laughs> what was at stake was the liberal in the old sense, in the 19th century sense. The, 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 the liberal plan of equality before the law and social honor, social respect. To put it another way, it was the breakdown, the beginnings of the breakdown of hierarchy. The beginnings of the breakdown of the great chain of being in the Elizabethan way of talking, where the whole society was organized from God to dog. By the way, dog is God spelled backwards, so <laughs> bear that in mind. But it's organized this way, and you're stuck wherever you are. You're assigned that position, and that's it. And that, I'm not saying it broke down instantly. I mean, the United States, this great country, had slavery until 1865. So let's not get too carried away with how wonderfully um, sweet this was, but it was a great improvement over the, the non-sweetness of most previous societies and all large previous societies. And that was a result, that in turn was not a result of some, I don't know, some special virtue of Europeans. It wasn't because Europeans have better genes. They have much better blue genes, but I don't mean that. <laughs> they, it's not because of genetic superiority or some deep advantage that Europe had. It was a superficial advantage, it was an accidental advantage of an egalitarian strain, an accident of, of the politics in Europe from the Re Reformation, the Dutch Revolt, reading, and revolutions. The English Re um, Civil War, for example, the American Revolution, indeed the French. The, the four R's, I call them. And those four made for a new conception that all men are created equal, are, in, are endowed by their creator with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This, by the way, was written by a guy who didn't even free his slaves when he died. So let's, again, let's not get too weepy about this. <laughs> It's not that nice, but it was an improvement. And the improvement was spectacular. It wasn't these other material things. It wasn't improved, I'm almost through. It wasn't improved property rights. We already had those. Uh, they're, they're essential, but so is oxygen necessary for a fire. But you would agree it would be at least unhelpful to explain the great Chicago fire of 1871 by the presence of oxygen in the atmosphere. <laughs> you do much better to talk about the very large number of wooden buildings crowded together, a long dry spell, strong wind from the southwest, and maybe Mrs. O'Leary's cow. <laughs> so, so the causes were accidents of European history, but now they're spreading to the world. This respect for the bourgeoisie, this respect for buying low and selling high, this respect for innovation, this allowing of innovation, which can easily be stopped with regulation or not in my, my backyard and so forth. That's what made us rich and will make the whole world rich. And the cultural explosion that's going to come from that, that's already starting to come from it, is going to be something to behold. Imagine when China and India 
come on, have incomes like ours, and can send as high a percentage of their um, population to college or to become artists or, or in inventors. My God, what an explosion. So, be of good cheer. The story is a change, a story of a change in ideology, of ideas. It's not matter. It's the idea of human equality that made us rich. Thank you very much. I'll sit down now because I'm old and I just had t two of my hip joints replaced. Uh, we'll take two questions now, and before we do, I just want to give my standard reminder. Questions have... Question marks! ...at the end of them and are not overlong themselves. So uh, when, you, when you are called on, uh, ask a question with a question mark. Who's calling? Or I call. Okay, I, I always like to have a female voice first. First of all, I want to apologize. Apologize for what I don't know. <laughs> and then Come I, w on. and then, and then, Me too. <laughs> and then, I really want your opinion. And I think we may be going back in the books because maybe it's not this book of bourgeois virtue, virtue. Or whatever. But will you help? me, us, understand the value of the stock market in terms, I feel, I am one of those income inequality leftists, uh -huh. okay? Sorry, oh, sorry, okay. sorry, oh. sorry. Some, some of okay. my best friends. Really sorry. <laughs> and oh, I want to, I really want to understand, I want, I want to, I don't want to be negative about it, but right now I am. Yeah. And I believe it's because I must not understand something. Yeah. And so yeah, when, when, we, when we ask about the, um, uh, well, well, the, the, the uh, stockholders need to be uh, rewarded. Yeah. And when the stockholders are rewarded, sometimes the people, yeah. uh, the workers or whatever are not rewarded. There, there are a few points to be made. In fact, there are about 20 points to be made, but <laughs> I'll only make a few. One is that, th that the workers own the stock through their pension plans, if they're fortunate enough to have them. And, we, you know, in the, wor the immortal words of Pogo, we, uh, we has met the enemy and he is us. That is, t the, the holdings of American of the ownership of American uh, business is in fact unusually widely spread. Now it's true that there are a bunch of people with tremendous stock market fortunes, but again, I, I, if that made people poor, then I would join you on the, on the barricade. Then I would hang the bankers and the Wall Street people from the <laughs> nearest lamppost. But it doesn't. <laughs> it's not the case that because some people have uh, um, those stupid, uh, I don't want to offend anyone here, but diamond encrusted watches <laughs> for $50,000 a, 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 a piece, that's not causing people to be poor. There's no simple redistributive technique that would actually help the poor very much. And as far as the functioning of the stock market is concerned, you want to come to love the stock market. I want to help you come to love it. I want you to love it. Because, because yeah, of course, your 401k, as I said, but also the stock market evaluates within the limits of the crooked timber of humanity. Out of the crooked timber of humanity, no straight thing was made, said Hegel. And, and all right, the, it's, it's imperfect. Those people on, on um, CNBC don't know everything. I keep telling my mother this, but she keeps watching. <laughs> um, but it's the best we have to predict the future and to guide the 
allocation of capital. It's not very good, but it's much better than not having such a market. If you, if you didn't have a forward market in corn, farmers would be much worse off than they are. In the same way, if you didn't have this forward market in ownership, this, this market in ownership, the allocation of capital in the economy would be very poor. How do I know that? Because places that outlaw stock markets do very poorly economically. Okay. Thank you. There is a question at the end, but I <laughs> want, just wanted to make a couple of comments. One, Dinesh D'Souza makes the same argument in his uh, picture, uh, America, that America's wealth was created, not stolen. Yeah, right. And two, uh, you talk about innovation, and I always think about Victor Hugo's comment that the thing more powerful than all the armies in the world is an idea whose time has come. And then there's the steam engine, which they say uh, built the bent the curve of human development because it freed us from human labor. Uh, my question, though, is given the historical success of capitalism, why is it that the right conservatives or capitalists have such a difficult time making the argument for the positive aspects of capitalism? Well, because they don't have a PhD from econo in, in, <laughs> in economics. Don't, don't try this at home. <laughs> no, it, it, it's because they get all confused. I mean, th there is a, there, one conservative argument that you hear a lot is, screw you, I've got mine. And that is not a very successful argument against people who don't have it. It, it really doesn't work very well. But there's a, lot of that, there's a lot of that going around. There's a lot of that talk. Um, and there, what <laughs> I'm doing a review of Thomas, P Thomas Piketty's book. And uh, he, he says, uh, oh, in Jane Austen's novels or in Balzac's novels, the rich are not guilty. They don't feel guilty about being rich. And that's how it should be. These darn modern CEOs, they claim that they got rich by being virtuous, and he hates that. But it's not completely stupid that they, on the whole, we got these innovations. People became rich by being first on the block to think up some novel thing. I mean, the, <laughs> the most crazy example is Facebook. Uh, whether or not he thought of it exactly is an issue. But it, it, it's, it's just seeing the $500 bill on the floor and picking it up. The right is not skilled at um, making these arguments. I, actually, my view is that they too much think of themselves. I'm, now I'm talking about conservatives. I'm not a conservative. I'm, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a libertarian. But they too much think of themselves as being pro-business. And that's kind of silly. Not because it's a good idea to be against business, but because business <laughs> makes money by making people better off. <laughs> that's the only way it'll work. If McDonald's, you say, oh, they make terrible hamburgers. But if people didn't buy the hamburgers, McDonald's would be a bust. It wouldn't work, you see. So there, the, 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 we on the right, if you want to call it, I don't like being classified on the right. I was once a Joan Baez socialist. I <laughs> sing songs. I know more socialist songs than my socialist friends do. <laughs> Joe Hill, the mill was made of marble, the machines were made of gold, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we should be defending capitalism as a plan for helping the poor, which is what it is. Right. Right. Go ahead. I happen to be optimistic, and I think you are too. I, but right now, seems like the bad guys can control the public sphere, control the argument, have made their case, and people are buying it. Imagine 
it's the year 2040, yeah. and we're looking back, how do we overcome the problems we have and get to a world where the people who are poor now are making $200 a day? Well, here, here's what'll happen. Countries like India and China are showing the way, and they'll get rich, and it'll be rather obvious how they got rich. They didn't get rich by having a consumer protection agency. It's, it doesn't all bad. They didn't get rich by having a stronger, um, a stronger uh, uh, food and drug administration, which is my horrible example of an agency out of control. Um, they, they, it'll, it'll be clear, and I'm hoping to God that it'll be clear to the countries that I know and love well. I know South Africa quite well, for example, and I'm very impressed that since 1994, the coming of democracy in South Africa, it hasn't broken down into a terrible ci civil war. This is a wonderful thing that, um, that the, George, the George Washington of South Africa made possible. I know Brazil a little bit. And here are two wonderful countries. Great music, <laughs> interesting places, and they've got these old-fashioned, protectionist, uh, industrial planning, silly um, policies. Um, the, the, you, what you need to do is get the Illinois Policy Institute down to those countries <laughs> and straighten them out. So I, I, think, I think it'll be as it was with the, with the cases of the Asian tigers. You remember the uh, Hong Kong. I'm going to go to Hong Kong for the first time in about two weeks. Hong Kong in 1948 had the same income as Somalia per head. Yeah, it was very, very poor, of course. And now it has an income approaching that uh, per head, approaching that of the United States, equal to countries like Britain, its former uh, um, ruler. So I think the example of successes, thank God for this, because if it was up to the, so the advanced countries, as someone was saying to me before, the advanced countries are moving steadily back towards socialism. But that, I think, will be undermined by the great success of roughly free market capitalism. There, there's a lot of um, corruption and so on, but I like to remind my, my I like to remind people that uh, Chicago's corrupt too. <laughs> you may have noticed. <laughs> My question is um, twofold. First, the, you've mentioned China, you've mentioned India, and you mentioned Brazil, okay? They have, as you recently know, have formed a World Bank with Russia and South America. What are the ramifications of their creating a new currency? How will that affect us? Since we're talking about them, you've mentioned them many times. And as far as the stock situation, Originally, there was like last week was something in 60 Minutes about the fact that the stock markets are rigged yeah. and the fact that there is a situation where before you buy an order, it's already been placed and you only get the higher price. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on both of those? Thank you. Well, I, I'm, I'm not so sure about this uh, se se second point, not that I especially doubt it, but I, I, I don't think that... Um, the little tiny details of how markets are organized are very important. What matters is that you can basically buy common stock, which means you can sell common stock, which is nice because with every buyer there is a seller, and that makes, that makes portfolios liquid in a way that's beneficial to everyone in this room. Now, now, as for new currencies and so on, I, 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 I go every year to a crazy conference, which you ought to hear about, called Kilconomics. It's Irish. It's held in the town of 
killed in Kenny, you know, the cats and all. And it's Kilconomics, it gets financial journalists and, and professors of economics up on a stage. And these Irish people actually pay to hear us talk, it's quite astonishing. <laughs> but the key is that the master of ceremonies for all the sessions is a professional comedian. So we can't get on our pompous horses and stride around. They, they, uh, they puncture us. And among the people who comes is a completely crazy guy. You'll see him on this Russian TV show, what's it called, RT? Is it RT? I think it's RT. And he's in favor of uh, 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 bitcoins. Now, I'm in favor of bitcoins too, but he's kind of crazy about it. <laughs> but, 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 but currencies only work if people want to hold them. It's really as simple as that. And if someone wants to make a new currency that they say is people who want to hold more than a dollar, my attitude is go ahead. <laughs> Have your bitcoins. <laughs> Try to make the, I don't know, the Chinese yuan the currency of the world. Go ahead. Give it a try and see what happens. And we get an advantage as Americans from getting stuff for little green portraits of George Washington. That's kind of a nice deal. But aside from that, it, as economists say, most economists will say this to you, money is a veil. Most people outside economics think that money is just really important. And, and uh, a, a, any professor of economics it, who gets in the newspaper gets, um, his na her name in the newspaper gets letters from monetary cranks who say, you know, professor, what do you think of my theory that if we made ice cream money, that would solve everything? <laughs> and my answer is, it's the real economy. It's the real productivity. It's the real stuff we make and do. That's what makes for our prosperity. We can screw it up with bad monetary systems, but our monetary system and our stock market is not all that bad. Thank you. So um, earlier, Deidre drew that uh, very compelling scientific graph starting over there. And um, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm a little worried about the mojo remaining in your finger. So. <laughs> No, it's strong now, but you know you never know in the future. So I, what we wanted to do is present you with this Illinois Policy oh. Institute pen oh, so, so that you can draw scientific oh. graphs in pen oh. instead of using your finger. Thank you. So, <laughs> thank you very, very much. Kind. Thank you very much for being here. Everyone, Deidre McCloskey. Um, so I, I, I want to talk a little bit about how Illinois is saved. Uh, currently, not in the future. Illinois is currently saved, and I'll let you ruminate on that for a second. But first, I wanted to introduce myself. Hi, I'm Jonathan Greenberg. Oh, hi. Uh, hi. What's your name? Marsha. Marsha. You Wait. should. We, we should have gotten you a name tag, and I apologize that we oh, didn't no, get no, you. No, you, no, you no, can no, have my no, name tag. No, I took no, it off no, earlier no, if you want. So, Marsha is exactly who we want to have in this room. <laughs> exactly who we want to have in this room. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I and and Marsha, I, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't mean to embarrass you, but you are exactly exactly who we want in this room. And the reason is. What John talked about earlier, Project Red Rover, Red Rover, Red Rover, let the moderate Democrat come over. The way that we win, leftist, right, I'm sorry, the, the, the moderate leftist come over. Um, so uh, I, I have been through my own conversion. Uh, it, it, hap it happened probably around eight years ago. Uh, and so I know what you're going through. I feel your pain. I feel, see, this is exactly the kind of person that we want in this room. So thank you very much for being here. Please come back. Uh, and now, uh, uh, I have good news, Illinois is saved, you can all go home, uh, and, uh, and, and that's if you believe uh, the report put out by the Quinn administration and the Quinn campaign uh, this week about our jobs numbers. Did any of you see this? Uh, Illinois now has a 6.8% unemployment rate, which is, is down and, and has, been, has been dropping. And the good news is, we have a low unemployment rate. And if you believe what the Quinn administration is putting out, uh, IDES, the Department of Economic Security, puts out numbers every month. Uh, and so our, our unemployment rate is down to 6.8%. The Quinn plan, I'm going to let that soak in for a second. The Quinn plan is working. 
Good news, right? Wrong. Wrong. And the, the only organization that was out there making the case on ABC7, uh, on Fox Chicago, elsewhere, the only organization that was out there pointing out the problems with those numbers was Illinois Policy, the Illinois Policy Institute. Michael Lucci, I don't know if Michael is here. Michael is our director of jobs and growth. He put together some brilliant information this week showing that since 2008, we actually have 170,000 fewer payroll jobs in Illinois since before the recession began. Just in July, just in July, we had 17,000 fewer people participating in the workforce just in July. The reason the unemployment rate is going down is because people are giving up and dropping out of the job market. People have fallen out of the job market. Exactly. People are falling out. That's exactly why the unemployment rate is going down. Now, the Quinn administration and the Quinn campaign, and if you can tell the difference between those two things, good for you because I can't. The Quinn administration and the Quinn campaign touted this like it was a big deal, that this is great, that Illinois has turned around. And one of the things that I thought was most interesting was the response of an unnamed, of course, Democratic strategist, quoted in the Chicago Tribune, uh, saying that, claiming that you should believe the Department of Economic Security and their press releases instead of your own lying eyes. <laughs> this is a Democratic strategist is an insult to the intelligence of Illinois voters. Think about that. That's a democratic strategist. Now, the other thing that you should think about is the intelligence of Illinois voters. These are the people that elected Rob Blagojevich twice, then elected Pat Quinn, and after the largest tax increase in history, gave uh, super majorities to the people uh, in both houses to the people that passed those tax increases. So the, the intelligence of, of the Illinois voter is, is tough to insult, and yet they have managed to do it. And the only organ, thank, go ahead, you can clap if you want to. <laughs> and we and you, the people who've supported us, the people who make the work that we do possible, are standing up and saying, wrong. Your numbers are wrong. It doesn't make any sense to self-congratulate, to pat yourself on the back, when 17,000 people gave up on working in July alone. We're doing that. And the only reason that we're able to do it is because you, you support us. You support the work that we're doing. You support the policy work that we do and the advocacy work that we do. So thank you. If you are not currently a member of the Illinois Policy Institute, you can join. There are membership forums in the back. Take one. Join us. Join this cause. Help us fight. Uh, and last but not least, I want to make sure that everyone knows that uh, Deidre will be signing copies of her book, available for $20 in the back. She'll be signing uh, as we mill around and, and uh, enjoy some, uh, some cocktails together. So please uh, go to the back of the room, pick up an Illinois Policy Institute membership brochure, pick up a copy of Deidre's book, and get it signed. And thank you all for being here.